Welcome to RPHE Summer Camp webinar series. My name is David Aravalo, and I'm an advisor service associate with RPHE. Now, I'm pleased to present today's camp counselor, RPHE's manager of consultant development, Michael Viljak, to walk us through RPHE's fiduciary fitness program. Welcome, and uh, thank you for joining us today. We'll jump right in here. Our topic today is fiduciary fitness program. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I always like to start off by saying I would be the first to admit that fiduciary fitness program can look intimidating. But today I'm going to show you why it is not intimidating and why it is such an important part of our sales and service integration and, and practices. And I think you'll agree that there is tremendous merit to this, not only for us uh, to justify our sales and service, but also for the clients that we're speaking with. So what we're going to do is we're going to review the three most important sections of fiduciary fitness. But first, I want to underscore that literally all of our RPAG deliverables can be very effective as both offensive and defensive tools. And what I mean by that, defensive, I mean servicing tools, and uh, offense, I'm referring to these tools as sales tools, tools as well. And I think that is particularly uh, the case with fiduciary fitness, and we'll, I'll show you why in just a minute. <clears throat> um, I believe that planned fiduciaries priorities primarily are to have a successful retirement plan for their participants. However, when planned fiduciaries become aware of their fiduciary responsibilities and liabilities, they quickly become interested in, in mitigating th these liabilities, as would all of us who understand th the, that this liability is a personal financial one. What we mean by that is if there's a fiduciary breach that in any way uh, works to the financial disadvantage of participants, and we are brought to court on this issue, the DOL can come in and take our savings account, our home, our spouse's jewelry, our car, any assets we have in order to make good for that fiduciary breach that cost the participants money. And that can apply to expenses and it can apply to investment, prudence, uh, uh, you know, or any other issues where there's this financial repercussion that is negative to participants. So let's look at the three sections we're going to review today. One is called the fiduciary diagnostic. And, and this is where we're gonna simplify the entire fiduciary fitness program. And then we're gonna look at education module one and education module two. And the reason these two are so important and commingled, I would suggest, I normally will combine one and two and present them together because Education module one talks about fiduciary responsibilities and liabilities. And education module number two talks about how to mitigate those liabilities, right? So when you're talking to a fiduciary and they are realizing that they have personal financial liability for any fiduciary breach, the next thing they're going to say is, how do we mitigate this responsibility? And, it, and it, it, it's not appropriate to say, well, I'll present that at our next uh, meeting to, and talk about education module two. And that just isn't going to fly. So I try to combine the two, although you can handle this as you see fit. So um, let's look at the fiduciary diagnostic. The, the fiduciary diagnostic is a document that if you were to print out every piece of paper that applies to the fiduciary fitness program, this 
piece of paper, this diagnostic is going to sit at the very top of everything. And the reason for that is because it is an overview of the entire process of fiduciary fitness education. I'll move on to say that uh, there's a blue banner that you will see across the top of the fiduciary uh, diagnostic. And it starts on the left-hand side going down with each of the action items. And these action items are the major responsibilities that planned fiduciaries have. So the action items, as you can see, going down on the left-hand column are selecting and monitoring fiduciaries, identifying and monitoring parties of interest, selecting and monitoring service providers, and ongoing. These are all the major fiduciary responsibilities covered right here. Uh, the next column on the blue banner going left to right, identify the education modules that speak to the action rel relative action items. So education modules one and two talk about selecting and monitoring fiduciaries, identifying and monitoring parties in interest, okay? Those are the education models. Now, immediately to the right of the reference materials, the education modules, are the supporting documents. And these are the documents that are going to provide evidence that the action items have been illustrated to the fiduciaries and that they are documented. A uh, very, very important item in ERISA is if you do not document a fiduciary action, it's as if, according to ERISA, that that action never occurred. So no documentation on a particular action item, like a selection of a fund, for example, or a replacement of a fund, means that it never occurred in the scheme of the fiduciary process to, uh, to prudently make that decision and that, uh, take that action. So supporting documents here are identified as a list of fiduciaries, a list of consultants and service providers, having an investment committee charter, we'll talk a little bit about more, more about that later, uh, resolutions to establish a committee acceptance and designation of, of, and appointments of uh, co-fiduciaries, we'll talk about that a little more later, and documenting parties and interest. The reason why parties and interest are important is because those are the entities or individuals that could engage in a prohibited transaction. So if you're ever in an encounter with an auditor, whether it be DOL, uh, ERISA, whatever, they're going to ask for a list of your parties in interest. And it's great to have that available because it shows that you are cognizant of your fiduciary uh, concern uh, here or your fiduciary responsibility here. So moving again from left to right, the fourth banner in, in blue it indicates fiduciary briefcase. And fiduciary briefcase is our online filing system. And it's a very good idea to maintain these documents in the fiduciary briefcase. Because if, if the plan is ever audited, and let's say the administrator who, uh, of, on, of the plan who is most comfortable accessing these documents, is out sick for a week or two, the auditor wants to proceed with the audit. And one of the worst things you can do in the event of an audit is tell the auditor, here's the filing system, go look through it and find whatever you need because our person is not in attendance, right? So, and the reason that, that that's not good is because this auditor is going to be filing through all of your information, and they're very likely going to find something that they never intended to review. But since it came to their attention, uh, they may have a problem with this. And if they have a problem with this, the plan has a problem with this. So it's best to, as a safeguard, have all of these documents in the fiduciary briefcase so you can say, you know, my administrator is out. Sorry that she can't help you. 
but let me go to my uh, online filing system and I'll get exactly the documents you need. The last column on the blue line is for comments. And those comments might indicate the date that you delivered these uh, education and documentation modules or just the, the progress you're making through this, uh, uh, th this process. Or it may indicate, for example, not applicable because one of these uh, action items is on murder, mergers and acquisitions, and another is on uh, uh, employer securities. So if, you're, if your plan is not uh, presently uh, having uh, uh, employer stock as an option for employees, then uh, you don't need to deliver that, uh, that education module. And the same thing with M&A. If they clearly have no interest in any M&A activity, you don't need to deliver that. But if that ever pops up as a potential issue, then that's a very, very important education module to go through with your plan that might be engaged in some aspect of a merger or acquisition. Okay, so that's that's this document. And as you can see, it itself documents what you've done and what you haven't done. And I love to use this in a sales situation. It's obvious how important it is as a service tool. But in a sales situation, it, it, I think it, it's, it, it's very important because it shows the depth and breadth of our fiduciary education services at a glance. And when I hand it out to a committee when I'm first starting to introduce this to the committee, I'll have uh, 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 samples for them. And I'll ask them to take that after the meeting, take a look at it, see if there's any uh, item under the action items that you would like me to deal with first, then just identify them to me and I'll make that a priority in our next session to go through that very rarely comes back to us because they really don't know what they need as a priority. So we march through this as we think is most important. And it might be right in accordance with the list of action items here. So, and I wanna pause here and say, I'm gonna leave uh, time for questions and answers at the end of this uh, presentation. So we'll, we'll have an opportunity to do that. Module one, fiduciary fitness program. Uh, here's, here's where we start. And let me say that most of these modules are expecting to be a, maybe a 15 minute presentation. And if you combine one and two, as I suggest, it might be 25 minutes, but I feel it's very important to combine the two of them. I'm gonna take a little longer with you today because I wanna give you some additional support that we might not be mentioning to the client or you might, without whatever uh, you see a need here. So who is a fiduciary? Well, it, it might be better to, to identify who is not a fiduciary. It's anyone who provides ministerial functions for the plan, like an administrator, right? A fiduciary is really any individual or entity that can that exercises discretionary control on the plan, whether it's the assets or the management of the plan. And that applies whether they intend to be a fiduciary or not. If you have the ability to exercise discretionary control, you become a fiduciary whether you expect to, whether the company expects you to be a fiduciary or not, you become a fiduciary. Every plan has to have a named fiduciary. A named fiduciary has specific definition under ERISA. And what it means is it's the primary fiduciary for the plan. And then that primary fiduciary has, the, has to be mentioned in the plan document and, and has to uh, delegate whatever responsibilities that named fiduciary does not want to, uh, to take on on their own. So the named fiduciary can delegate responsibilities to 
what is known in, in ERISA as co-fiduciaries. And a good example of that might be the investment committee, right? The, the name fiduciary might be the president and the president is going to delegate these responsibilities to uh, the investment committee. Functional fiduciaries. As I mentioned, if you act as a fiduciary, if you function as a fiduciary, meaning uh, have, have uh, some control over, over the plan, you become a fiduciary. So even if you have no expressed delegation, you still can be a fiduciary. And uh, an example of fiduciaries are board of directors or trustees who have power over the, the assets. But board of directors is important because uh, they may not want to be involved in the plan. And many, many plan documents name their uh, name fiduciary as, as the, the company. And the problem with that is if it's a small company and the company is the president, then that's fine. But if there's a board of directors associated with that company, the name fiduciary is going to refer to that board of directors. And, that, and in many cases, the board of directors wants nothing to do with the ongoing management of the, the K plan. They, they may not even be employees of the company, right? So be careful about that. Uh, and here they're differentiating fiduciary duties from settler duties. Settler duties are duties of the plan that are not fiduciary in nature. And they're very simple. They're a decision to establish a plan, to uh, include plan features, and to terminate a plan. All the other duties are fiduciary duties, and they're listed here as well. Uh, Co-fiduciaries are those I already mentioned. Uh, who name fiduciaries delegate. And the fiduciaries that do the delegation are not liable for the acts of the co-fiduciaries as long as they monitor those co-fiduciaries on a regular basis. And typically that's annual. Uh, a board of directors, board of trustees uh, are only fiduciaries if they function as, as fiduciaries, right? They can delegate. Uh, authority, uh, just as the uh, a named fiduciary can do, but they must monitor if, in fact, they do delegate. Then there's benefit and investment co uh, committees, right? Uh, benefit and investment committees are fiduciaries if they de have de been delegated those responsibilities. Best practices is to adopt a committee charter, which we have a uh, model for, uh, uh, for your convenience. And a committee charter, along with uh, meeting uh, minutes, uh, are, are very important to, uh, to the plan because it identifies that delegation of fiduciary responsibilities and identifies, for example, the IPS that shows how they're going to be managing the investments. So uh, very important. And if it's a, if it's a corporation, they should designate meeting minutes to indicate that they've adopted a committee charter on a, on a specific date. Very important to do that. So here, prepare a board res, adopt a committee charter action item, uh, make sure the committee members uh, sign an appointment form. And they also, by the way, should sign a resignation form because one of the little quirks, and there are many in ERISA, if you don't sign off as a committee member, a fiduciary, the uh, ERISA still holds you responsible for the other committee members' action unless you leave the company. So a lot of, a lot of times a, plan, a committee member will say, you know, I'm really busy right now. I, I can't make uh, the, the committee meetings uh, for a while. Well, if they're not there, they're still responsible for what the other committee members do. So you either have to clue them in, or if they're really not coming back, they have to sign off. Trustees and fiduciaries. Trustees uh, are fiduciaries due to the management and control of plan assets, right? A trustee can be either a discretionary trustee, which means they are in complete control of the plan assets, or a directed trustee, which means the plan trustee has 
uh, uh, anointed another in, individual or entity to have this certain discretionary authority with respect to the uh, the, the plan assets. That is typically typically the case when you're working through an insurance company, uh, for example. Written minutes should be maintained. Trustees can resign in protest, uh, or they can just resign any time. Investment advisor. Well, uh, under uh, parlance of ERISA, an investment advisor is an ERISA 321 uh, advisor, and they exercise control in that they're bringing investments to the committee for them to select as appropriate for that plan, right? And the other requirement to be a 321 is you have to render this advice for a fee. Now, investment managers under ERISA uh, are actually what we consider an ERISA 338 advisor must be a bank, insurance company, advisor registered with the 1940 Act, and they must acknowledge their fiduciary discretion in writing. Attorneys, accountants, actuaries, actuaries consultants, employees, typically none of these entities have any interest in being a fiduciary. And in many cases with attorneys, actuaries, accountants, they don't want to be a fiduciary. So, but if they act in a fiduciary manner, if they exercise discretion, they also become fiduciaries. So employees are generally not planned fiduciaries, for example, but they can be depending on individual facts and circumstances. If they're on the committee, right? Or if they uh, have uh, discretion over plan decisions. Individuals prohibited from a fiduciary role. In many cases with a client, when I'm presenting this, I'll just say, look through these issues really quickly. And if for some reason there's a concern here, let me know after the meeting, because I don't want to read through this whole thing. And it could be embarrassing for someone to raise their hand in the middle of a meeting and say, yes, I've been convicted of a felony. Um, so action step is complete the list of fiduciaries. ERISA 404A responsibilities. 404A are the original uh, fiduciary behavioral code under ERISA. And it is vague and it is easily misinterpreted and constantly misinterpreted in court, by the way. But it does say have some important ingredients like number one, a fiduciary must act solely in the interest of plan participants beneficiaries and alternative pays. That means literally you can't be making a decision that is in better, good interest of the company, but not in, in uh, very best interest of the participants. And this was actually tested a number of times. So be very aware that, you know, this is a, a, a very key issue and ingredient in ERISA 404A. Uh, other 404A uh, uh, inclusions are uh, carry out duties prudently. Now, we'll get back to that in a minute. Follow the terms of the plan documents. Diversify plan assets. Pay only fair and reasonable expenses. Like, what, what's a fair or reasonable expense? It's really hard to determine. It's not easily quantifiable. That's why we do a lot or suggest doing a live bid every three years and use normative data to benchmark fees on an annual basis. It's because that's the only way you can document reasonableness of fees. Now, carrying out duties prudently is important to understand because like many, uh, like many words, they have different interpretation under ERISA. And prudent to me as a lay definition is, let's say I'm going to buy a car. So, you know, I, I look at some dealerships, I go online, I check some prices, I go in and negotiate, find a model I like. And if it seems like a good deal, you know, I'll, I'll buy it, right? So that's 
That's my definition of prudence. Do some research and come to a reasonable conclusion. That is not the definition of prudence under ERISA. I'll explain to you exactly what it is, and I'll use as a, as a good reference point our scorecard. So prudence under ERISA means, number one, you have to identify an issue that the fiduciaries are going to examine. And let's say on a scorecard, it's a fund that's been on the watch list for four consecutive quarters. So we should be talking about that fund. Um, second part of, of procedural prudence under ERISA is you have to have the required expertise. That's the you know, reason that every 401k plan should have an advisor a fiduciary advisor, because even when there is an FSA, for example, and I've had this happen on the committee, they, that person doesn't want to take the responsibility and the liability for making investment decisions. And they don't want to take the time to be doing the research. So we are the expert in terms of the definition of prudence to bring expertise to the consideration of this the the, uh, uh, the fund that we're uh, pursuing, right? So that's one. One is to identify. Two is to have the expertise. Three is to uh, come to a conclusion about a fund. What are we going to do? Are we going to continue it on a watch list? Are we going to uh, make a replacement? And number four is to uh, conclude and to document that decision, right? To, to provide evidence of that decision and why we made it, which is the meeting notes in our executive summary of every meeting when we're talking about a fund. And then you have to confirm that it actually did take place on the day it was supposed to take place. And you have to review that fund periodically to make sure it remains a prudent decision. And of course we do that with the uh, scorecard in our FIR, because we're always looking at that fund and its performance over the past one, three, five, 10 year period. So that solves the, the issue of reviewing it periodically. Uh, so that's prudence, appropriate consideration, uh, a determination that a course of action is reasonably designed to further the purposes of the plan. Well, obviously, we're going to be making these prudent decisions for the best interest of the participants and the plan. Uh, some of this language here is more a reference to DB plans, because when ERISA was first formulated and 404A was first uh, promulgated, it was all about DB plans. Liquidity, portfolios, uh, construction, uh, follow the terms of the plan document, uh, you know, that, that is pertinent to both plans. Uh, be familiar with the documents, you know, plan document, the summary, plan description, administrative procedures, carefully review documents, and review plan administration, very important to review that so you can uh, ensure that it is in compliance with ERISA, because there's so many areas where you can go out of compliance and not even be aware of it, like a delayed remittance or a uh, forfeiture not being uh, 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 handled at the appropriate time. Uh, another requirement is to diversify investments. And this, again, is more DB oriented. Of course, we want a diverse menu, but uh, with a DB plan, it's more important uh, 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 from on a, on a uh, eventuality standpoint. Uh, relying on information for others, you can, you can rely on, on information from others and basically, what they're talking about here in a DC plan is uh, an attorney, an accountant, uh, the uh, record keeper, et cetera. Uh, and it's important to uh, you know, appoint, as we already talked about, the trustees and the fiduciaries according to 
uh, a, a reasonable process. It says here that you're not supposed to appoint them based on their position within the organization, but it normally works out that they are, some of the people are C-suite people. I mean, it's hard to avoid that, but they, if they can uh, bring some expertise to the table, that all the better, right? Um, fiduciary terms are indefinite. Uh, plan fiduciaries must monitor uh, their performance on a reasonable basis. And we do that when we report to the name fiduciary. And this reporting process, which is their monitoring of the fiduciaries, really you just need to bring, let's say you do four meetings a year, you bring your four uh, 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 meeting notes to the, to the uh, name fiduciary and basically, basically say, here's what we did this year. We're going to do the same thing next year, except we're also going to go out for a live bid, that kind of thing. It doesn't have to be a laborious process. Reporting and disclosure requirements, of course, you have to be in compliance with all of the reporting requirements under ERISA and disclosure requirements. Fidelity bond, a lot of people confuse fidelity bond with insurance. Fidelity bond is for the purposes of someone uh, who has access to payroll, for example, uh, to abscond with the payroll. That's what the fiduciary bond protects uh, plan assets with. Now, the, the other way it can, it can happen is somebody can call up the uh, record keeper and say, I want to pay uh, the, these attorney fees, so pay the attorney fees for me. Well, if it's imprudent to make that decision, or if the individual that calls for these monies is not authorized to do so, but is processed anyway, then that applies to this fidelity bond. Fiduciary insurance is very, very important, but it isn't necessary under ERISA. I think you're, it's ridiculous if you don't have fiduciary insurance, but the fidelity bond is required under ERISA. Uh, Action items, establish a prudent process, conduct audits, uh, uh, confirm appropriate fidelity bond is in place. This is a very brief schematic to identify who a fiduciary is and isn't. We already went through that, so we don't really need to do it again. So we're gonna move on to module two. Module two includes fiduciary liability explained, right? I mentioned that. Fiduciary is personally financially liable for any losses resulting from a fiduciary breach. The departmental, there's also departmental labor penalties if you engage in uh, be above and beyond what you may have to restore to the plan. And the, the DOL can uh, enact a civil penalty of 20% of the assets. Uh, they can waive or reduce that if they think it's appropriate to do so. Uh, or you can go to the voluntary fiduciary compliance program and say, hey, I made a mistake before they catch it. It's a great idea to do that and uh, make, make amends, correct the process. Uh, voluntary is, is very, very important. Uh, there's co-fiduciary liability for any of those delegated fiduciary responsibilities we mentioned. Uh, fiduciary takes all of the reasonable and legal steps to prevent a fiduciary breach that is occurring among the committee, for example, but fails in preventing a breach, then such fiduciary should not incur liability for the other's actions. But you have to take reasonable efforts or else you are uh, just as responsible. Uh, breaches before or after a fiduciary uh, being a fiduciary, you can be responsible. Uh, a fiduciary cannot be liable for a breach that occurred before they became a fiduciary or after. But even though a fiduciary may not be liable, liable for the breach, they must take steps to remedy the breach if they are aware of the a breach and a failure to do so can be considered a subsequent breach. Individual fiduciary liability, the name fiduciary is not liable for what they delegated, but they have to monitor and they have to develop procedures for monitoring the individual, which, which we just mentioned. Terminating a fiduciary uh, must follow a process. And again, a fiduciary should sign out if they're, no, if they're leave, not leaving the company. 
uh, uh, we recommend here very strongly fiduciary and liability insurance. Make sure it covers ERISA fiduciaries. A lot of these insurance policies don't spe specifically cover ERISA, which means they're not covering ERISA. And I, I, so many times I've seen the client hand me an insurance policy that doesn't cover ERISA fiduciary breaches. Uh, draft an IPS, we all know how important that is. And that refers to the action steps here. We're gonna move on. Indemnify fiduciaries. Now, it's important for the plan to say, we're indemnifying the fiduciaries and we're also buying insurance. So we don't have to pay out of pocket for indemnifying the plan fiduciaries. It's really unfair for a group of employees to be chosen to run a committee and for the employer not to take financial responsibility for any fiduciary breaches because the vast majority of fiduciary breaches are unintentional, even the big ticket ones where there are tens of millions of dollars at stake. Uh, education and documentation, fiduciaries need to understand their responsibilities. How do they do that? Well, they do that because we deliver a fiduciary fitness program for them. Uh, hire a trustees and investment manager. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. If you don't hire an investment manager, then you better have the credentials and that person be ready, be ready to take that fiduciary responsibility. Hire an investment advisor. We all know why that's important. Hire uh, you know, any other advisors that can be uh, uh, help the plan, lawyers, consultant, administrators, establish participant directive accounts, of course, uh, and conduct periodic audits. Action step, hire, monitor, appropriate outside consultants, establish participant directed accounts, conduct periodic audits. And that's it for one and two. And I think I covered both of them in about 20 minutes. So these are not onerous and most of the other ones go quicker, by the way. These are the, this is the most important because employers need to know what their liability is and what their responsibilities are and how to mitigate that. I've had presidents of companies stand up when I'm presenting this and say, well, maybe we should uh, 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 eliminate our 401k plan because I don't want this liability. And my response typically is, well, you know, you're certainly free to do so, but, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you might want to keep it. And as long as you're doing business with us, we're going to meet with you during the course of the year. And we're going to be able to sniff out any potential fiduciary breach way before it occurs, unless you go out and do something, you know, kind of off the cuff that has financial impact and you're not bringing us into it then you know, that can be problematic, but most plans don't do that. We're, we're, we're very much in step with every fiduciary action they take. I'm gonna stop because it's quarter up and ask if there are any questions. Yes, certainly. So it looks like we have one. Where's the committee charter document? Uh, that will be located in the resource center within our PAG. Um, if you have any questions about where exactly it is, uh, please email into support at rphe.com. Uh, we'd be more than happy to direct you where it is. Thank you, David. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is a very important document. And it's, and it's structured so that uh, we, we put in like the kitchen sink. There's a listing on one page of all of the items that we think sh might be included, but you can go through them. And if it doesn't apply to your plan, you just, remove it. So you can cut and paste to customize for the plan. And again, that along with a board resolution indicating that you're adopting this plan charter and the IPS with the signatures of the uh, committee members, let's call them the co-fiduciaries, very important. And then, you, then you've got a lot of protection for that client that they wouldn't have Otherwise, again, a very important servicing, but a very important sales conversation to have with your with your uh, plans and your potential plans. Awesome. Um, any questions? Uh, is there another question? Yes, we actually have two more. Um, okay. 
The first one, please talk about the duty of loyalty a bit more. There are lots of trade-offs between what is in a company's interest versus participants. Uh, for example, changing the match. Please discuss settler versus fiduciary decisions. Please give an example of duty, loyalty, conflict, and how it should be resolved. Thank you. Yeah, th th this is an issue that is concerning to some extent, primarily because it hasn't played out in court. The only thing that we know about the interpretation of the vagarity of this statement is at one point in time, the uh, uh, ERISA attorney committee went to ERISA and basically said, um, we have a potential conflict here uh, based on 404A. And I'll explain that conflict to you. We have committee members who are co-fiduciaries appropriately appointed, but they're also participants in the plan. So is that a conflict that we uh, should be concerned about? And actually what happened is ERISA had to write a letter out and they do these letters of clarification from time to time saying, it's okay if you have uh, actual participants on the committee that are making decisions uh, on the plan, as long as the, the accent isn't, and they didn't use that term, isn't uh, for the benefit of the plan and not for the participants. So that's all we've got to interpret that, but that's an excellent question. And I wish I had a better answer for it. Maybe someday it'll get litigated. But the way we handle that in our day to day is you know, if, if and, and this used to happen in the olden days, 30 plus years ago, uh, an employer would come to me and say, you know, I want to buy a piece of property that I might develop later, and I want to have it in my 401k plan. Well, that would be a good example of not doing it in the sole interest of participants. Although it may end up being in the best interest, maybe it'll appreciate tremendously in assets, in value, but it's not one that is considered to potentially be in the best interest of participants, according to ERISA. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. And then we have one last one. At what size of plan would you recommend fiduciary insurance? Lawsuits are almost unheard of under $100 million. Does a $4 million plan need fiduciary liability insurance? Yeah, well, let me first say that law litigation is coming down market rapidly. And there are a number of reasons for that. Number one, the litigators have gotten better informed. In the beginning, they were throwing, let's say, mud against the wall to see what sticks. And they were all over the place. They had no idea what they were talking about in many cases. And a lot of the actions got thrown out of court. But they're refining now because they've gone through the battles. And in some cases, the, the attorney fees were greater than uh, the, uh, the financial deficit that occurred. So a lot of plans are getting wise to that. And everyone is getting more educated in what might be a, a correctionable action and what might not be. So uh, I would be strict with plans under $100 million for sure. They're actually coming down to the 50 million range now, and they're liable to go quicker. And they may be part of class action. So smaller ones can be combined. Uh, so I, I think you should be in. Uh, in tuned with these issues, and you should be participating as if they were a, a, a consequential plan in terms of uh, litigation, uh, because it's the right thing to do. All, all these uh, steps here should be going on anyway. You know, if you're an actionable plan, you, you should definitely want to be very, very much in. in uh, in tune with these items. But even if you're not, this is the best way to, to, uh, uh, to discharge your, your fiduciary responsibilities. And it's not that hard, right? Once you get acquainted, as I hope we started to do today with fiduciary fitness program, the, re the rest is, is, uh, is easy.
Awesome. It looks like that was our last one, Michael. Okay. Let me run through my notes really quickly and make sure I'm not leaving something out. Yeah, and most, most of these litigations are, you know, a function of unreasonable expenses or expenses associated with investments or uh, just, uh, you know, uh, inattentive behavior. But some of them, I want to caution you, since we do have a few minutes left, some of them are, are very well-intended uh, actions that have been taken. And they clearly are in the best interest of participants. However, they may not be backed up by planned documents. And the one that jumps immediately to mind is one plan uh, that I remember seeing litigation on uh, indicated, in the, uh, uh, indicated to their participants that they were going to be uh, putting in a, a target date fund. And of course, that's in the best interest of participants. Uh, and they did that. But their IPS didn't indicate that target date funds would be one of the uh, appropriate investments for the group. Now, clearly, it would be appropriate, but it isn't identified in the IPS as a category of funds that the participants would have access to. So they were taken to court and they lost. The plan lost. And that is a, you know, a good example of ridiculousness of how some of these issues are interpreted. Now, it's not ridiculous because it should be in the IPS, but it's kind of more of an oversight issue than an egregious fault on the part of the, the, the planned fiduciaries, clearly. So that's why I think you have to be important you know, at any level of plan size. Yeah, the insurance issue is, is really a big one. And I mentioned that what I, the way I pose this to my clients, because I am concerned about their fiduciary insurance, I say, do you have fiduciary insurance? And almost 100% of them will say yes. And then I'll, I'll soft sell this, so to speak. I'll say, well, that's great. Uh, I, and, but there's been a lot of changes in fiduciary insurance policies because the, the environment has gotten uh, a lot different. The environment is constantly changing. If you'd like, I'd be happy to review your fiduciary insurance policy just to make sure it's robust and it's contemporary and it has all the bells and whistles you'd want it to have. We don't sell in, uh, uh, fiduciary insurance, so we're not doing this on our best interest, but, but you are in our best interest. So we're doing it for that purpose. And invariably, they'll give me a, a copy of it. And invariably, I'll find that it's not uh, a solid uh, document, not a solid insurance program. Many times it's a DNO policy or it's an EBNL policy that doesn't that restricts uh, from fiduciary behavior, from fiduciary's behavior. So uh, you know that, and and that helps us with our relationship with the client, obviously, because they're misconceiving their level of uh, uh, of protection, and we're helping them correct that. Uh, but it also, it's it's important that. Uh, they keep the policy up and they, they do contemporize it from, from time to time. There's one clause that particularly buggered me over the years. And I got into the fiduciary insurance issues with insurance carriers to the point where they didn't know some of the key points that they should be covering. And they changed their, uh, their, their uh, insurance documents as a result of our conversations. And one of them in, uh, was a clause, which I've seen fairly pervasively, that says, uh, a sign here saying that your plan has never been out of ERISA compliance, right? That, that makes sense to put in a clause like that. The problem is you never know if you're out of compliance. With, with ERISA, because the only way you know is if you're brought into court and the judge tells you you're in compliance on a particular issue, that particular issue for that 
particular point in time, and they don't deal with any of the other issues you might be out of compliance with, or you can be in compliance with that issue today and out of compliance tomorrow. So you never know. So I got the insurance carrier, some, some national prominent insurance carrier to change that statement and say, to the best of your knowledge, has your plan ever been out of compliance with ERISA? And you'd know that because you've got, you'd have to go through a compliance process to establish whether or not you were in compliance. And let's say due to an audit or due to litigation or whatever. So I wanted to include that today, too, and we're, we're down to the three-minute mark. So I'm going to stop talking and ask David if he has some uh, final words and to ask you if some questions come up in the future, send them on to us, and they always go directly to our uh, ERISA specialist team who are f former practicing ERISA attorneys, about a dozen of them. So we, you'll get good, solid responses from us and you'll get them quickly. Okay, David, it's yours. Awesome, thank you so much, Michael. We really appreciate that. And just to add on to um, that last comment from Michael, you can always send in those ERISA related questions to our email, support at rpag.com. And we'll go ahead and forward those and we'll, we'll kind of be the, the middle person for you there. David, um, one more one more comment real quick. Sure. I, I, meant, I wanted to mention that mm -hmm. all of the uh, fiduciary education modules are in the resource center and they're all recorded and you'll probably hear my voice on the recording. So if you want to look at them and hear them being presented before you go to the client, feel free to do so. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Michael. Yes, yes. Those are all also uh, located in the Video Learning Center um, and their corresponding modules uh, within the Resource Center. All right, Michael, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And thank you all uh, for joining us today. Um, just have one last slide. Next week is our last uh, webinar in the summer camp series here. Uh, the title is going to be Prospecting with the Focus on Custom Solutions. And the presenter will be Tom Hoyer. All right. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, we really hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.